Hello, everyone. Thank you once again for joining us uh, for our talk and, and one of the ASIC talk. One of the ASIC talks. I'm Peter Kmitra, and I am the stream owner for the uh, Machine Learning in Climate uh, stream. Uh, we are very privileged to have Noah uh, Brenovitz join us uh, and, and give a talk with us. Before I introduce Noah, I'll just briefly talk about ACE. ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers uh, that are gathered around topics in AI research, engineering, and products. We host free live sessions like this three to five times a week and produce premium content in various subject areas. Please visit our website at ai.science and log in to access slides from this, as well as other sessions that have come before. Also, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, as well as follow us on Twitter uh, under the same name. We have currently about 14 different streams that are focused on various topics in ML, and this session is in the machine learning for climate stream. Hope you enjoyed this talk and come back uh, again for a future uh, presentation. So. Uh, we have Noah Brenovitz with us. Noah is a senior machine learning scientist for climate modeling at Vulcan Incorporated. He was a Moore Sloan and WRF Innovation in Data Science postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington and was jointly mentored by Christopher Bretherton at Atmospheric Science and Nathan Goods in Applied Mathematics. In 2011, he received his bachelor's degree in statistics from the Stern School of Business at New York University. After one year as a postdoctoral a uh, post post back trainee at the National Institutes of Health, working on functional MRI, he began his PhD in atmosphere, ocean science, and mathematics at NYU's Courant Institute of Mathematics with Andrew Maida as his advisor and recently graduated in May 2017. Noah's research lies at the intersection of applied mathematics, machine learning, and atmospheric science. He's interested in applying machine learning techniques to improve the representation of subgrade scale processes in coarse resolution atmospheric models. In addition, he also studies the fundamental dynamics behind the organization of large scale moist convective processes in the tropics. So welcome Noah to ACE and we look forward to your talk. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, Fitak. It's my first time doing a YouTube stream, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so in this talk, uh, I'm going to describe a body of work that I started as a postdoc at University of Washington with Chris Brotherton and has sort of continued on in a new form at a, at a company called Vulcan Inc. So the main motivation is that we use these important tools called climate models to help predict future change. And the way they work is by numerically solving the fluid equations governing the atmosphere and ocean. So a climate simulation is essentially a weather simulation solving these uh, fluid mechanics equations, just done over a longer time scale and with coupling to the ocean and to other parts of the, cl of the climate system. So there's a many approximations in this system, and many of these approximations are due to the large discretization size uh, of the elements over which we discretize these fluid dynamical equations. So a typical climate model will have a resolution of around 50 to 100 kilometers. And that's sort of showing here, this, uh, this grid box is in the, on the globe. And you can see that these grid boxes are closer to the size of New York than they are to the you know, side of individual thunderstorms. So, so clearly things underneath that scale have to be dealt with in some way. Um, but nonetheless, uh, climate models are typically quite certain about future changes in temperature. So this is showing the trend over the predicted trend over the next hundred years in a business as usual um, emission scenario. And the, the stippling here, the dots show regions of where the climate models of, on the whole, you know, there's about 30 models going into this figure and they all agree with each other. Um, and so basically you can see for temperature, they agree um, that the temperature will increase on every spot on the globe. However, um, there's much less certainty. Oh, there's some artifacts here in the, in the slide, but for, for precipitation shown here, there's much less certainty. So we can see that uh, in some regions, model will predict the, that the precipitation increases, whereas in other regions will predict a drying out of the atmosphere. Um, and whereas before the stippling covered the entire globe, 
here we can see the, in hatching these lines, the areas where they disagree with each other. So I know the figure is kind of an artifact, but you can see that in certain regions, there actually are strong predicted changes in the, um, in the precipitation, but high uncertainty between the models. So that says that not only are we uncertain about future precipitation over regions like the African Sahel or the Southwest of the United States, but we know that they could be big changes. So there's a big uh, drive to, to reduce this level of uncertainty. So the big question of this work um, of the whole climate modeling community is can this, is this uncertainty unavoidable or can models be improved to help drive down that uncertainty? Um, so some signs of uh, current climate models do show signs that they can be improved. For instance, they don't accurately reproduce the certain observed features of the observed climate of the past climate. For instance, if you look at the of the average precipitation over the observations from satellite on the left and models on the right, you can see that there's a big disagreement in the total amount of annual precipitation. In particular, there's a region in the models that tend to predict a larger amount of precipitation in the Eastern Pacific than occurs in reality. And this is known as the so-called double ITCZ or intertropical convergence zone bias. It's, it's one of many possible, many known biases in how current climate models represent the, the current climate. So the idea is by hopefully we can reduce some of these biases on the current climate and therefore drive down our uncertainty in the projections in the future. So if we pull back the hood of a climate model, um, we have to look, take a look at which components of the climate model uh, we can target for improvements. Um, and so some of these components are more trustworthy than others. Uh, so whether climate models are so complex in part because they couple many different physical processes together in a completely interactive fashion. These components all must work in concert. Now we are relatively confident in the accuracy of some of the model components, such as the dry dynamical core. This is the part of the model which essentially blows the wind around and moves large scale weather systems. And so we have a pretty good idea of how this works and we've been doing projections with these kind of uh, large scale dynamics, skillful forecasts for decades. Um, in general, we're much less confident about how these other processes are represented in climate models. Um, and so in particular, we're quite, um, quite uncertain about how to represent um, phase changes of water and clouds in the atmosphere and, and things like uh, deep convection. So it's a tricky thing to predict how much keep deep convection uh, thunderstorm occurs given large scale conditions. So the idea is that hopefully we can improve the representation of some of these processes while leaving the existing implementations in place for the other processes. So we don't wanna relearn Navier-Stokes. We wanna we want to improve the source terms affecting the, the right-hand side of those fluid dynamics equations. So why is uh, this um, so-called uh, parameterization problem, that's the problem of representing these subgrid scale processes, why is this so difficult? Um, well, the reason is that a lot of these important processes occur on a grid scale smaller, a scale smaller than that of the grid of a climate model. So here I'm showing kind of a scene of, of, a, of deepening convection of a growing thunderstorm. And you can see that there's a lot going on here. You have these high clouds shading the ground below them. This has an effect upon the radiative heat budget of the planet. Um, you have some clouds that are in growing form of convection, then you have sort of almost almost uh, mature thunder clouds. And this is what the climate model sees of that image, it, sort of a grossly pixelated form, but you can see, well, it's bluer at the bottom, but at the top. So, you know, the presence of white indicates that there's probably some convection there. So, so you can see that you can, you can predict to some extent what's happening, um, maybe the gross effect of it, but the details are lost. And that's the parameterization problem. So in, instead of solving the fine resolution equations, basically we end up solving their coarse resolution equivalent shown here. So I'm showing the coarse resolution budgets for dry static energy. Um, here is S, it's a temperature-like variable, it has temperature in it. 
um, and then on humidity, which is the water vapor mixing ratio, as well as a momentum equation here. That's the third equation. Uh, so these budgets are forced by some terms which are known on the coarse grid scale, um, such as advection, this V dot grad S term. These on the left-hand side of the equation are terms which we know on, this, on the coarse resolution. Um, but on the, the right-hand side, we have these residual terms which affect these large scale um, budgets of heat and of moisture. And we don't know exactly what those are. And so the goal of parameterization is to write these terms on the right-hand side of these fluid dynamics equations as functions of only the coarse resolution variables alone. So that's, that's the closure problem to make this a closed system. And so Q1 is the, is known as, it's not great terminology, but it's been around for 30 years and it's known as the, the apparent heating. And, and this has the effect of, you know, the sun shining, radiation, um, uh, latent heating from phase changes in clouds. Um, that's what drives deep convection is, you know, the, the water condenses and releases heat, which causes vertical motion. Um, likewise, Q2 is the apparent moistening. Um, and this includes phase changes of water. And Q3 is the term, is the corresponding term for the turbulence, for the, for the sorry, for the momentum budget. It includes things like turbulence um, uh, from subgrid scale turbulence. So anyway, Q1 and Q2 are the main targets. There are predicted, and pr they're the variables we're trying to predict with machine learning. So the traditional method for parameterization is that the, uh, some observations or possibly high resolution, more, more high resolution, more expensive simulations go into the brain of a scientist. And this brain produces a simplified flow, you know, sort of cartoon of what this process looks like. And then this cartoon gets turned into Fortran code and plugged into a climate model. So this process is sort of inspired by data, but not uh, rigorously connected to the data. Um, so in summary, we wanna make climate models better in order to produce better um, estimates of future precipitation. We have evidence of substantial biases in current climate models, and we think we can do better um, by improving the sub-representation of sub-grid scale processes. So what's one obvious way to um, improve the representation of subgrid scale processes? Uh, brute force, <laughs> resolve them is the easiest way to resolve subgrid scale processes. And this is a big effort in the, in the climate, well, we haven't done climate simulations, but in the, in the atmospheric science community is to run so-called global cloud resolving models. Um, so we think of a cloud resolving model as having a resolution of a, about a kilometer horizontally. Um, and so in this, this is a uh, plot actually shows uh, nine images. Eight of them are from global cloud resolving models. One of them is from satellite observations. So I'll let you guess uh, which of these um, panels is actually the, the real thing. Uh, the point being that they all look pretty good. Um, and, but why can't we use these for longer term simulations? Um, well, first, single 36 year climate run with this. This is a kind of a back of the envelope calculation of how much uh, computational cost it consumes. And I think the most interesting one is that it consumes about 20 gigawatt hours of electricity, um, 600 tons of CO2 equivalent, which is basically the same as one person flying back and forth between Europe continuously for a long time. So it's not currently extremely feasible to do climate projections with these kind of simulations. But if you could, they do represent reality better. Um, and so this plot's a little busy, but it's showing a time series of precipitation averaged over the continental United States predicted um, by a few different setups. And blue is a global cloud resolving model you can see that it produces an expected late afternoon peak in precipitation. This is like an observed feature of, of precipitation over land. Um, in orange and in green, we have coarser resolution models. And you can see that not only are they noisy, they get precipitation during the wrong time of day. Um, so it's kind of important if you're making predictions about precip in places that people live. <laughs> so, the main motivation for my work is instead of brute force, can we improve course resolution models with machine learning? 
So the idea is replace that brain with a black box with a computer. So the, what are the inputs and outputs for a machine learning parameterization? On the left-hand side are um, humidity, um, dry static energy, this is temperature-like variable, as well as some extra variables which we um, think are important, such as the sea surface temperature, the amount of sunlight coming in the insulation, as well as the heat fluxes from the surface, uh, from either the land or the ocean. And, and so these are scalar quantities here. They're basically fluxes into the bottom and top of the atmosphere. Um, but these are vector quantities, humidity and dry static energy. And in this case, um, they're the number of vertical levels. So we're predicting the heating and the moistening, um, which are also vectors as a function of the data at a given horizontal location. So the assumption here is that the processes we're attempting to resolve are vertically non-local, but horizontally local. Um, so to predict how much heating is occurring at 10 kilometers, we need to know what the temperature is at one kilometer elevation. So we started this work out with an aqua planet prototype. Um, so many people will put a obligatory uh, water world from the movie. They'll put a slide up of you know, Kevin Costner and water world when they say this. It's, a, it's basically a, sim a simulation of, of just uh, of the atmosphere over a planet consisting entirely of water. And this removes the complexity of land and topography. And so it's a pretty um, common setup for uh, initial uh, development of parameterization. And, and so we set up a coarse graining problem um, of a four kilometer cloud, global cloud resolving model simulation of occurring over aqua planet here shown. And this just shows the, the zoom in of this four kilometer simulation. Then we coarse grained that simulation uh, 40 times over to 160 kilometer grid boxes, which are more um, on a climate, more sort of the resolution of a, of a climate model. And we attempted to train a parameterization with the inputs and outputs I showed on the previous slide um, using this coarse grained data. So the inputs, as I said before, are the humidity, static energy, and the um, SST as well as the radiative flux, the sunlight coming down from the atmosphere. We want the ML to know what time of day it is. And then the outputs are the heating and moistening, which I introduced on the slide with the equations. They're the things on the right-hand side, the source terms of temperature and of, of humidity. Um, the data size is about 2 million samples um, because we have 100 and it's a, so the resolution is 128 in the horizontal direction and 48 and uh, 64 in the vertical direction. So that turns out to be per time step of that simulation, 8,000 samples. We have about 320 time steps. So that, that ends up being 2 million samples. So this is not a data poor problem. This is a data, very data rich problem when you're working with numerical um, model output. Um, in particular, it's been sort of challenging to push this much data through um, through machine learning algorithms. They seem that they're not really designed for this kind of scale, um, or at least they've easily. Um, and we're using very simple ML. I don't want to disappoint anyone, but we're, we're simply, we're using multi-layer perceptrons right off the shelf. Um, we're not doing anything fancy ML-wise. All of these are extremely simple, um, kind of naive settings of hyperparameters. Um, it's been a lot more challenging to formulate the problem. So Noah, just so that uh, we understand, you know, the background of the problem better, you're using the coarse, uh, uh, coarse screened simulation as it, uh, for your machine learning. I mean, um, I, I didn't follow that part entirely. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. So basically uh, we coarse grain this high resolution simulation. Yeah. 40 mm -hmm. times over, mm -hmm. this produces coarse grained um, humidity temperatures, you know, all the state sure. variables. Sure. And then it also, we predict, we compute these Q1 and Q2 quantities sure. um, from the equations on the previous page. So uh -huh. we use finite differences to compute those. Mm -hmm. And so then that sets up a, your, you know, your input data set sure. and your output data set. I see, okay, okay. So using and the then, coarse grained as your, um, uh, as your input data set. Okay. That's correct. Okay. We're using the coarse grained, yeah. 
So all the equations I showed on the first slide, those are all barred. So, so it's coarse grained quantities. Um, sure. And some of those are, yeah. Okay, thank you, Noah. The one thing that you may be missing is that it's we're averaging, it's, it's the making this horizontal locality assumption. So that's why it's 34 is the number of vertical grid levels in this model. And I so see. that's why we're, it's sort of predicting an, an atmospheric column to an atmospheric column. And, and what a, is the resolution of the vertical? It, it, it varies. So at the bottom okay. of the atmosphere, it's around um, if a matter a few meters sure. in the boundary layer. But then once sure. you get above that, it, it spaces out considerably to be about a kilometer. Sure, makes sense. Um, Thank you. So in terms of how this scheme does offline, meaning um, how does it do just at predicting the outputs that we trained it with? Um, it turns out that this problem has been done in the past um, and most notably by uh, Vladimir Krasnopolsky several years ago. And uh, that's why I'm showing his slide here. And, and this is showing a similar machine learning promise posed slightly differently where they try to predict the cloud fraction given the uh, humidity and temperature. And you can see that while these two panels look identical, um, so the machine learning is able to predict um, the amount of cloud given the temperature and humidity. Um, so that's it's not a trivial task. It's basically the same thing as what we're trying to do now. Um, in terms of our data set, um, if we weight by mass, the R squareds we have are about 74% um, for the heating and 62% for the moistening. So we're capturing, a, let's say the majority of the, of the variability in our data um, in an offline sense. Um, but offline, for this problem is, is not the most interesting thing. So an online an offline performance is not the same as online performance. So we're not interested in how the neural network does as a once and done prediction. We wanna see how it does when coupled to a fluid dynamic solver. And that ends up being a, very challenging to do. As an intermediate step, um, something that's often done is to run a so-called single column model, which is to couple a um, neural network or a parameterization to itself and run several iterated time steps with a uh, ignoring the um, dynamic coupling with the atmosphere. And if we do this, we see that the uh, neural network predicts that the temperature is 10 to the 35th after one day. Um, and so this is a classic sign of, of numerical and well known. Sometimes if you uh, learn of incorrect numerical discretization, you'll, you'll tend to predict blowups. And the reason this is happening is because when we minimize this error um, over, over a single, we had a three hour sampling in the data, but over a single sampling period of our data, um, then we may be like, we're maybe minimizing this gray error here. That doesn't preclude the fact that it can grow very large in future time steps. Um, so the way we got around this particular problem um, in the setting was to instead minimize the mean squared error accumulated over multiple time steps of integration. Um, and this is easy to do with neural networks. It's, it's all differentiable. So you can use PyTorch or any automatic differentiation code to do this. Um, all the parameters are the same as before. The loss function is different, but the, all the hyperparameters are the same. Um, and we explain almost exactly the same variance in an offline sense. But when we integrate it forward in time, instead of 10 to the 35th Kelvins, we reproduce the, the truth almost exactly. So in the top panel, I'm showing a time in the x-axis and uh, pressure or height um, in the y-axis. And this is a humidity anomaly. So it's not necessarily important you can to see, but in the truth data set where it's red, it means it's become moister in the middle of the atmosphere. And if we plot the neural network's predictions, starting with this initial condition, you can see that it, the variations look almost identical to the, to the truth. Um, the bottom panel shows a single column model version of the state-of-the-art climate model. Um, and you can see that it predicts the timing of these moist outbursts very well, um, but it does miss, it, it sort of messes up the vertical structure of these. Um, so it's not exactly an apples-to-apples apples apples comparison, but um, the ML, this trick of minimizing the multiple steps worked pretty well. However, 
that's not full online validation. We're still not coupling to the fluid dynamic solver. We've coupled it to itself, made predictions over a period of time, but we haven't actually um, turned on the PDE solver yet. So that's what we tried next. Um, and lo and behold, it, it also becomes unstable when you couple that network to the, to the fluid dynamic solver. So in this case, the fluid dynamic solver we use is a coarse resolution version of the same fluid dynamic solver that produced the four kilometer data. So we take that fluid dynamic solver, we change the resolution, it's just a name, that's a, that's a configuration option. And we insert our uh, machine learning scheme into it um, by having Fortran call Python, which is kind of interesting. Um, if you want to talk about how to call Python from Fortran rather than the other way around, um, I'd be happy to. And so anyway, this is just showing that in the tropics of the simulation, there's this super moist storm that's emerging that I had to make a blow up on uh, because this color bar didn't fit it. <laughs> and so anyway, in the next time step, uh, this, this simulation actually crashed despite the fact that the, this, this neural network was working very well in single column mode. Um, so anyway, the, we've trained these um, neural networks with a large cloud resolving simulation. They're accurate offline. They're accurate in so-called single column setup. They still don't work in the spatially extended aquaplanet simulations. And the question is why? Um, and to get at that, we need to do a little bit of machine learning interpretability work to figure out, uh, well, is our machine learning methods, it's predicting its outputs accurately, but what inputs is it using to predict those outputs? Is it learning to predict, um, is it learning to sort of replicate our own opinions of how convection should work? Because we know that, you know, humans have been designing parameterizations for decades and they don't necessarily lead to blow ups. So, maybe humans that might have some good idea about what the um, relationship between um, convection and precipitation and, and the input variables are. So the simplest um, way to do that for this work was to look at the so-called linearized response of the neural network. And um, there's different ways of calling this. You may know this as uh, saliency maps. Um, you may also know this as the Jacobian. That's basically what it is. It's the derivatives of the outputs of our network with respects to the inputs of our network. And so this can be visualized as a matrix shown here. And so I'm just showing one panel of this, there's of this matrix, but on the right-hand side is, or on the, on the vertical axis is the predicted, um, the response in the, in the moistening, in, in the amount of moistening due to a perturbation in the X direction. So the X axis is the input, the y-axis is the output. So the way you read this out is that having a single um, gram per kilogram of water inserted at uh, 250 millibars will result in this column amount of heating at vertical levels. So this, if, if you interpret this, you can see that um, putting a tiny amount of water vapor in the upper atmosphere will dramatically increase the predicted moistening at all levels below. So basically this is saying, well, like you can predict the precipitation based upon small fluctuations of humidity at the top of the atmosphere, which we, which we know is just not how it works. I mean, we know that it precipitates strongly when it's hot and humid at the bottom of the, and you know, where we are. <laughs> the hot and humid days have big thunderstorms. And this is sort of not, not replicating that relationship. Um, and so the reason that that relationship is there is actually because, well, like precipitation is really highly correlated to that level, but that correlation isn't necessarily causal. It's, it's there because the, you know, the way that humidity gets to the top of the atmosphere is by having a thundercloud bring it up there. And so it's sort of getting the Darrow of causality wrong there. Um, and so we did the simple trick, which people are not a huge fan of, um, we call it ablation. We basically chop off the top half of the atmosphere when we train the, the neural network. And we sort of take the, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil approach to it um, and retrain this neural network, excluding those levels that had these, these strong um, uh, sensitivities. And this, when we do this, the configuration runs stably um, for as long as we want. And 
uh, it has improved forecast accuracy. Here I'm showing several curves, but the main story is that the uh, blue curve, which is where we remove those, ex those input features um, from the training, has lower um, root mean squared error of humidity uh, than either the base simulation, a control simulation, or the one that has all of those features added. So we can see that this trick, it works. And, uh, so we have reasonable forecast accuracy, but we still have long-term drifts in climate. And that's kind of the, a big problem right now is that even though we have uh, decent accuracy, we can see that the principal waters, the amount of water in the atmosphere is, is, is slowly decreasing in these runs. Um, Moreover, we're having trouble replicating the, this is the total column heating. So, you know, during noon, this is higher than during, during the uh, nighttime, midnight. And so we can see that we're not able to quite replicate this peaks of the heating during the evening uh, or during, the, during noon. So we have some problems with long-term climate drift in these simulations. They're stable, um, but more work to be done. So that was the aqua planet setting. Um, and there have been some other authors working in, in that area. Um, and so the question is, can we take some of these lessons learned from, from aqua planet and apply them in a more realistic setting? And that's what we have started to do at, at Vulcan Climate Modeling. So there's about um, 14 of us, seven of us on the ML team, and we're working on improving the, uh, basically the, the nation's weather model. Um, so this is a model known as FE3GFS, and uh, as of a couple of years ago, this is actually the model producing um, predictions uh, in, the, in this country. And so this is a fully complex model. It, it has a, a complete suite of uh, complicated and ever-changing traditional parameterizations. Um, this, we're sort of working with the research uh, fork of this model. And it also has land. <laughs> Um, so you can imagine that land is a pretty significant source of non-stationarity in a machine learning data set. Before we had everything at the same level, you know, no height. But how do you learn about what's going on over Mount Everest from, from other places? It's sort of a unique spot on the planet. So that makes the machine learning problem a lot more challenging. And it also makes the data engineering problem more challenging too. So in our previous work, we predicted the full moistening, that was Q2, and the full heating. So this, we predicted, we didn't use any of the existing parameterizations. I mean, we, we sort of trust radiation. We think we know how radiative transfer works, um, but we didn't use that. Uh, in this case, um, we have used setups where we, came, where we use the residual heating and moistening um, from a set of baseline physics. So as our base for the results I'll show, we use clear sky radiation. This is, this is the radiative transfer, the cooling of the atmosphere and the heating of the atmosphere that would occur without any clouds present. Um, and then we also include boundary layer turbulence, evaporation, and um, sensible heat transfer. So that basically we allow this scheme, we allow this model to use the existing parameterizations to transfer heat from the surface and water from the surface into the atmosphere. Um, and then we turn off all the other moist physics. So we don't use the traditional microphysical or deep convective parameterizations. So it's basically a dry, it's a dry model. Um, and then we explore a couple different machine learning models. And I thought I might share these results about comparing random forests with neural networks. So uh, we use random forests um, pretty off the shelf as well, use with these hyperparameter settings. Again, this is a very data rich problem. So we have data rich in the sense that we have a lot of data, not necessarily that it covers the variability we need, but we have a lot of it. And so we use a lot of samples per tree. And then we compare this to excessively simple neural networks. These are pretty preliminary results, but three layers, eight neurons each, <laughs> very simple. Um, and we show that the, in this case, both of the random forests and the neural network, again, they make very similar predictions offline. So on the left is the random forest. And in this case, we're predicting the, the precipitation, basically. And we can see that, well, it's predicting, you know, precipitation in the tropics where we expect it rains a lot, you know, 
in tropical Africa and in the tropical Atlantic. It's also predicting precipitation in these storms in the Southern Ocean. So this, this uh, particular time is August and this is the winter time in, in the Southern Hemisphere. And so that's when they have powerful um, cyclones and fronts. Um, so it's not a good place to be sailing a boat in the Southern Ocean. Um, and then on the right central network, and you can see that uh, you know, from the eye level, the prediction is quite similar. Um, and if you look at RMSE of this particular plot as well, it, it's, uh, it's also quite a similar um, skill score. Um, they do differ in their predictions at, the, at each individual vertical level, but in, in the, taken on the column average, it looks pretty similar. Um, but if you plug these online, we see that random forests tend to be more stable when coupled to the fluid dynamics solver. So I'll just play these videos and see if they see any differences. Um, so anyway, the random forest, uh, it seems to run, it's a little, it, it, it works pretty well going forward. We can see that there's pulsating as this is, as the sun passes over these regions. So we can see that it, it's capturing a diurnal cycle of convection over land, which is a good thing. You can see that it's raining in the tropics um, that it has these same fronts going online. And the simulation here is 10 days long and it, it doesn't blow up, which is good. <laughs> and yeah. However, when we play the, the neural network, you can see that despite having the same offline prediction, it's almost, it, first of all, it has sort of a less speckly character to it. It has more of a, a kind of a continuous nature of it. And then if you look closely, you can see it's almost like setting off these bombs, <laughs> these regions of extremely strong convection. If you wait, look here near Indonesia, you'll see one will pop off and then um, this simulation actually died right after that bomb went off over Indonesia. So we can see that, you know, if you looked offline, these, these two algorithms would give, you know, indistinguishable results, but online they have totally different characteristic. And, I thought that's something that, that I would uh, like to leave you with, um, that it's sort of like the machine learning problem we're setting out, we're solving it, but it doesn't necessarily work um, when we plug it online. So in terms of conclusions, um, the first point is what I just said. Um, the second point is that we can uh, use model interpretability tools like the sail and sea maps, and we have looked into more of those. Uh, if you're interested in that, we, you can check out a paper we have on the archive. Um, to help one build faith in our ML schemes predicting the right thing, which I didn't show as much, um, but also help us solve failure modes, help us find solutions to these instability problems. Um, the key challenges with this effort are the numerical instability when using um, neural networks. Uh, for a lot of reasons, neural networks are nice. Um, they're quick to evaluate, they're low memory requirements, uh, they sort of fit with a notion of they're not they don't feel like a lookup table they feel like you're actually learning parameters and maybe that's just me um, but they tend to be unstable when coupled to fluid dynamic solvers and so that's why it's nice to start with random forests um, I think that that advice kind of extrapolates to lots of machine learning work it's random forests are pretty robust um, easy to diagnose as well um, we also have problems with longer term drift um, it's another application of this problem of online versus offline is once you turn on the fluid dynamic solver, it's pretty hard to, it's, it, you have to, when the machine learning is trained in the absence of the fluid mechanic solver, it, it doesn't really know what to do in response to the fluid mechanics. Um, and random forests are more stable than NNs. So with that, yeah, that's, um, that's the rest of my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And I'll Thank leave so up this slide with uh, some references. Thank you so much, Noah. Uh, this was this was great. Uh, I have a few questions, and um, you know, I'll ask them uh, first. Uh, so, so one thing, if it would really help, if you could kind of uh, differentiate the online versus offline learning, um, uh, is it the a posteriori and a priori testing paradigm you're talking about, or uh, you know, like when you say online, uh, does it mean it's coupled with the PD solver and also training with the new data, updating the weights, or is it uh, just coupled to the PD solver with the same old weights that has been used while, while, while it was uh, being trained? Yeah, that's the last thing that you said. Okay. So it's there, we don't, 
we don't have online training yet. Sure. sure. The multiple step trick with the single column model, that mm -hmm. was sort of an attempt at online training. And we took advantage of the fact that we could use PyTorch to do automatic differentiations sure. you know, through time sure. in that way. But sure. um, that approach doesn't really work when you have a fluid mechanics solver that you can't take a derivative of through. Right. Yeah. Um, so we, when we do online, we're doing offline learning, online evaluation. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, so, so other question I had is um, what do you, have to comment about the compute time between the um, random forest and the neural network in your last example, like how do they compare? They seem to, you know, one obviously is better in terms of online performance, but uh, what is your, uh, you know, feedback about the compute time or how much time does it take to train um, just so that folks are aware? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So a comment, I'm not too familiar with how the neural networks, they're pretty fast. I mean, they're negligibly, sure. you, it, they cost no time sure. when you run them. Sure. The random forests, um, the compute time scales with the number of trees you use in the ensemble. Yeah. And so when we used too many ensemble members, uh, we couldn't really, it was very expensive. Sure. So right now we're using, I think, we have 10 trees basically, or 13 trees. Mm -hmm. And sort of by mistake, I trained one with a hundred trees one time and it was just taking way too slow. So it kind of crossed the, crossed the boundary where it was started to be more expensive than the fluid mechanics solver. Sure, sure. So, uh, but have you tried things like Rapids AI to, uh, you know, QML libraries to speed things up? Um, I mean, in my experience, you know, they do help, uh, you know, speed these, uh, these, these uh, you know, uh, normal machine learning with simple machine learning models, quite, quite, well, quite well. Um, if you what, are those, what are those? It, tools? It's called QML. It's uh, CUDA ML QML. Uh, it's a rapid AI package, and um, um, in my experience, like I've used it for SVC different decision trees, and they you uh, you know give a much uh, mm. much big speed boost without uh, you know without appreciable drop in accuracy. So, uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, the, the other um, question that I had is you showed the, um, uh, you know, the, for, for the aqua planet example, the second example that you showed, uh, you had uh, a columns of a, um, uh, uh, you, you, there were regions where the more, the gradients were quite high, uh, uh, and you kind of cut them off, uh, to kind of make the model predict better. Um, That's right. any, any reason, um, uh, you know, like from your perspective, what you could do differently in hindsight to get these gradients, uh, you know, more accurately modeled, uh, and how, how does that affect the credibility? Pre like, uh, how, how, how does that affect the, uh, effectiveness of the model in terms of predictions uh, because if it if it uh, you know are, are these only some random cells that are random regions in the in the in the in the entire domain uh, that can be ignored or or things like that just so that you know we understand what is the implication of doing that yeah i mean it's a, it's a whole interesting kind of story i'll try to be brief um sure. i can show this slide sure. this slide basically shows you why the model is very sensitive to the humidity at 200, at 200 millibars, the up top of the atmosphere, and showing precipitation in orange versus this is the thing we're trying to predict, and sure. blue is this input. So you can see that they're super correlated. Mm -hmm. um, this star, you know, and, and that's a feature of the data that's there. And I think it's there because of the time scale separation that the humidity and the upper atmosphere rains out very quickly and doesn't live very long. And so its time scales are very fast compared to the processes that we're trying to learn. Sure. And so then we're kind of mixing up these time scales and it turns out that you can't really predict this as on the, on the same um, kind of in a hand wavy sense. So, so, so it's not only a multi-scale problem, uh, but also, you know, different time scales too. So that definitely sounds very challenging. Yeah. It's uh, like our, the thing we're trying to predict has, processes with a variety of time scales in it and we're trying to we're trying to train the model to predict all of that at the same time and you know it's for instance like we might be trying to train a neural network to predict 
um, something that it couldn't actually, that would be unstable when used in an oiler stepper. Sure. So yeah, it's, Interesting. Um, so um, about the long-term um, drift that you mentioned uh, in your, uh, I think, conclusion slide, or, uh, you know, that definitely comes from the numerical side, right? Because it's not, uh, because these are PD solvers and non-linear systems, and therefore small differences initially could lead to large, is, is, that, is that the explanation for that? Or possible explanation for that? Yeah, I, mean, I wish I knew exactly what the explanation was. I, I mean, we're we're still we're still dealing with this problem. Um, some people have have solved this problem in the context sure. of uh, of some machine learning problems. Like um, Paula Gorman has made a a scheme on the on the same problem or a very similar aquaplanet setup that that did not have this climate drift. Mm. Um, my personal thoughts on it are kind of ongoing and ever evolving. So I don't know if I'll, I don't know if I have too many great ideas. I think it's related to the fact that the model will make errors sure. and features that are important to the predictions it's supposed to be making. Sure. And so that it's sort of the places it makes errors are exactly the wrong places. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's just a hand waving guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. That's that 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 is definitely my uh, intuition as well. So um, I'm I'm very interested in uh, and and I feel uh, you know some of the uh, viewers are also interested in learning about the uh, trick you did with the minimizing the mean squared error. Um, I think that's new uh, for me personally. So could you just explain that one more time um, about minimizing the mean squared error accumulated over multiple time steps? I think that was pretty cool. How that. Yeah. So basically, the that's the idea is to minimize this big gray area, uh -huh. um, and you can kind of view that as a different way. Like you could view it as a sequence to sequence prediction problem, where sure. if you're familiar with like recurrent neural networks, where yeah. you know into your algorithm comes in you know the initial condition, and then it makes a prediction of the whole time series in the future. Sure, and then you. Uh, you view that as a supervised learning problem, sequence to sequence prediction and minimize that full error. Sure. Sure. You could also view it as a, a sort of a time stepper type approach. Um, Interesting. And it's, I mean, honestly, this is, this is the idea of minimizing error over multiple time steps is, is something that is called in, in, in atmospheric data simulation to come up with initial conditions for weather models, uh, places like the European Center for Midwage weather forecasting will use um, something called 4D variational data simulation, which is basically this. It's find the day, find your initial condition, which minimizes the error that occurs after a matter, after a few time steps, after several um, reanalysis analysis periods of three hours. So, so they do backprop of full weather models. It's just, wow. If they do, it's just, it's just very expensive. They can do like, they do 40 iterations or something. They, they can't really afford that many iterations and, they sure. use like Newton solvers instead of these mm. uh, kind of atom optimizers. So it's just sure. like, it, it wouldn't, I don't think it'd necessarily work for neural networks, but in principle, it's kind of inspired by data assimilation. Interesting. And, and uh, how does that hyperparameter, that window that you have 15 hour to five day affect the solution? I mean, uh, obviously, you know, intuition would say that, uh, you know, depending on the problem, the longer windows might help, but but what does your uh, experience show? So if you go too long, eventually the the gradients from the latter part of that period don't mm. really don't really yeah. give you yeah. any in information that's useful. So it ends up sure. harming. The, um, and so there's a nice paper with um, this problem here, as I posted, isn't exactly chaotic. But for chaotic problems, once you once you move that multiple step prediction window beyond like the chaotic, you know, the Lyapunov time scale, yeah. that, that gradient is completely useless. <laughs> that so, makes perfect sense. Mm. Yeah. And then if you go too short, it blows up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, this is very interesting. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you so much, Noah, for, for your time. I think we really enjoyed a lot, uh, you know, learning about your work and all the new stuff, uh, especially, uh, you know, the, the, the emphasis on using simpler models to make these, uh, you know, 
make these surrogates, I think uh, was was pretty fascinating to see. Um, thank you for your time, Noah, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, please uh, come back again at at a future event of ACE. Um, thank you. Good night. Okay. Thanks for your talk. Thanks, Noah.